All right, let me know when you wanna get started. We usually record the meetings. Hopefully that's okay, Melissa. Yep, yep. Excellent. So I just recorded. I just wanted, I'm Cindy McGlenn. I'm the director of the Senior Center here in Stoughton. I wanted to thank uh, Mayor Swadley and especially um, Melissa uh, Agard for, Senator Agard to uh, join us today. So thank you very much for your time. I'm glad to see a lot of familiar faces on the screen, but also some new ones. So that's great. Um, if uh, we're going to let uh, Tim start off the meeting, but uh, if there are questions, um, maybe wait till the end before we get through there, and then uh, we'll take our time and and answer everybody's questions then. So go ahead, Tim. All right, thank you and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We do have some guests here. Uh, we have Senator Agard and uh, Aaron Collins. And we'll start with Aaron. If you want to just uh, introduce yourself, I put a little bio up here for you. And you can uh, introduce yourself and then uh, introduce uh, Melissa when you're ready. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor Swadley. Um, Really appreciate being on here today um, and for Mayor Swadley uh, inviting us to be here. Uh, so I am Senator Agard's chief of staff, um, started in January. Uh, I had previously worked for Senator Agard when she was in uh, the state assembly. Uh, I've worked in <laughs> politics and uh, state government for about 10 years. Um, and I'm happy to be on here today just to introduce myself as, um, uh, you know, me and Megan Whitman, who's also on the call today, uh, are two people who are likely going to be your points of contact in the office. If you call the office, if you email the office, uh, we are we are here to help. And uh, we've we've already had some great uh, interactions with with the mayor's office and um, you know just folks in Stoughton on various issues. So um, always happy to have a conversation. Or if you just want to call the office to say to say hi, we are. Um, working in the office. Uh, some days we're, we're at home today, uh, but um, hopefully one day soon we'll all be able to, uh, you know, meet up in the Capitol once things are safe again. And um, even better, we'll be able to come out to Stoughton and see all of you. So thank you for having us. All right, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Senator Agard. Um, She's here to basically tell you tell you a little bit about herself and what she hopes to do. Um, I put a map up here. You can see Melissa, so you can explain the district. And then I also pasted some of the issues that I know you're going to be working on. And uh, we we appreciate such a such a robust agenda um, for somebody coming in, and and we're we're pleased to have you. We know you're hitting the ground running here. You have the experience that we need in order to move things forward. And hopefully uh, you'll be able to do that in a bipartisan form. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor Swadley. It's really a pleasure to see you. Um, and I look forward to being able to do some good listening today and learning about the other folks that are on the call um, and to hear about what is so very important to you and your community. Um, I am pleased that I have a number of folks from my office on the call with us as well. You've met Erin. Um, Megan Whitman is on the call as well, and she is my outreach director. So as soon as it is safe for us to spend time in Stoughton and across the district, she and I will be out with other members of the team, including Erin and Sydney and our amazing interns, who I believe are on the call. Um, spending time in your coffee shops, um, I looked I really enjoyed that before COVID hit and um, your diners. And I know that there's a couple of taverns in your community that look exciting. And I um, really know that one of the things about Stoughton is that your main street is robust. Um, you have an awful lot of pride in your community. Um, and it's really important for me as a new state Senator to be able to get to know these new parts of Wisconsin that I have not had the opportunity to re represent before. So um, my name is Melissa Agard and I served for four terms, eight years in the state assembly before I was elected to the Senate um, in the 48th assembly district with, which on this map is the smallest section, um, kind of the Northwestern section on this map. Um, 
and it's primarily the north and east sides of the city of Madison, as well as um, the village of Maple Bluff. And I was born and raised here in Madison. I graduated from East High School and then went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, received my bachelor's degree. I'm the mom of four amazing boys. You see their handprints probably above my head here. Um, and they are uh, really as different as the four points on a compass, but um, they center me and really give me hope for our future. Uh, they range in age from, I guess on Monday, I'll have a 23 year old um, and the youngest one just turned 11 uh, uh, very recently. Um, they, uh, you know, have been experiencing as we all have the challenges of navigating life with COVID in my house right now is very quiet, but I'm gonna apologize ahead of time that if someone has trouble with their classes, um, their computers or the internet, you're likely to see a visitor pop on the screen today. Um, the 16th Senate District was previously represented by Mark Miller. Um, he was there for 16 years and he lived in Monona um, and, we, and about a year ago announced that he was not gonna run again for the state legislature and has retired from public service. He's a great mentor and friend um, and is there for me when I need him and his previous staff members as well are supporting my office. Uh, as you can see on the map, the three assembly districts fit within the Senate district like pieces of a puzzle. In Wisconsin, we have 99 assembly districts and 33 Senate districts. Um, the 16th Senate district is comprised of the 48th assembly district, which was previously represented by me and is now represented by Representative Samba Balda. Um, the 47th Assembly District, which is the southern part of the district, Fitchburg, McFarland, um, is represented by um, Representative Jimmy Anderson. And then we have this, uh, the 46th Senate District, which you all live in, as well as some prairie, which is currently represented by um, Gary Hebel, um, who I'm sure you all um, know well and has an awful lot of pride as being your state representative. Uh, these are an amazing crew of folks um, that I have the opportunity of working with and um, you know you should see their offices as well as mine as allies and anything that you or your community need in order to be able to move forward. I realize that I can't do my job um, without each and every one of you. Um, I very much believe in servant, um, the servant model of public service. Uh, I, be I believe and uh, culture in my office is that you all are our bosses. Um, we need to hear from you and what it is that's working and not working, what your dreams, expectations, fears are um, that, you know, so that we can go forward with a robust policy agenda. It's challenging as a member of the minority party. Um, you know, we had to readjust what it is success means. Many of our colleagues in the majority party, success to them is passing bills. Um, and to us really, uh, it is acknowledging the importance of um, being in the minority party, the voice of dissent and really putting out as well a positive proactive agenda of what it is that we believe Wisconsin can look like. Um, if things were to be different. Uh, I have, uh, and I appreciate the mayor putting many of the policies that I have been outspoken about and that frame my work in the legislature. Um, right now, certainly with COVID, we realize the challenges of this pandemic. And I very much believe um, in science and public health and uh, am so appreciative of our frontline workers um, at all levels, whether in our grocery stores, our daycares, um, in our public health offices, senior facilities, um, firefighters, doctors, nurses, getting us through this. Um, but at the same point, I realize um, that this pandemic is just exasperating many things in our society that have not been working well for many, many people, whether we're talking about um, safety nets in our communities um, for people who become unemployed, healthcare, um, unemployment benefits, family leave. Um, those are all really very important, um, a living wage. We really need to do better and more on that. Um, additionally, over the last year, it's been highlighted um, over and over again that for well over a decade, in fact, generations, Wisconsin has been the worst place in the nation um, for folks who are black and brown. Our racial disparities, 
um, need to be addressed. Um, and we need to be looking at the world through a frame on any policy we put forward in support. Is it gonna make a positive impact or a negative impact in racial disparities for our friends and neighbors? Because certainly um, your ability to get work, to graduate from high school, um, uh, to survive childbirth, um, to live your first three years, um, to live a full robust life, um, to not be diagnosed with diabetes, um, to not be arrested should not be defined by the color of your skin. I think we can all agree that with that. So certainly we have an awful lot of work to do. Um, and I am grateful for the leadership of Governor Evers. He is now re um, rolling out teasers for his budget. Um, he will be releasing his budget to us next week in full. Um, and it is clear that he has a people's agenda. I believe very much that budgets are moral documents. Um, and I look forward to being able to see more about what it is that the governor is including in his budget. But so far as teasers have been very exciting, um, investing in our rural communities, investing in our public schools and broadband, um, addressing medical costs, access to medicine for seniors in our communities, um, supporting our farms, legalizing cannabis, expanding health care. Um, that's just to name a few of the things that he has put out on the table. So once that budget is, put, is proposed next week and in, in full, um, we will be back out with you all. Um, there will be a lot of opportunities for us to have conversations with one another, similar to this in small groups um, with, with roundtable chats via Zoom. Um, and we will also have larger listening sessions and um, opportunities for engagement there. My team has come out uh, full force. Uh, we did a listening session um, uh, intro to the district, um, touched over 10,000 people uh, with that within our first month, um, heard amazing things from folks, have had lovely phone calls, emails, um, and letters written to our office. I very much enjoy reading the local papers for the communities in the district and anything that you all can do as individuals who call this part of our state home, um, we welcome you to reach out to us and let us know about what it is that you believe we need to know more, whether it's an event in the community that you wanna invite us to or make us aware of, whether there's someone in your community who may be celebrating a birthday um, you know, of, of note of 75 or 100 years, quite possibly anniversaries um, with employment or with relationships, um, new businesses um, or old businesses um, that really, we want to be able to celebrate that. And um, you know, it's harder with, with COVID, but we look very much forward to being able to be there with you um, and learning, with, learning more about your community and being more, more part of your community as well. Um, so I've been talking a bit here and I would love to be able to open this up. I have, sadly haven't been part of these coffees before, but I'm imagining mayor um, that we can have a, a kind of a chat and go back and forth. And I look forward to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, I do have one question uh, so far, and that came in from uh, Mike Connor, and he wanted to talk a little bit about the Innovation Center, and we've we've talked about it briefly, but I think Mike is is part of the meeting here. So, Mike, if you want to introduce yourself and maybe give some quick history and and you know maybe find out what it is you'd like the senator to do to help us move this thing forward. Well, thanks, uh, Mayor Swadley, for the introduction and welcome, uh, Melissa, to our community. It's an awesome community. I'm a transplant here. I came from the little town of Oregon, just west uh, of here. So I didn't go, I didn't uh, move too far, but uh, I've lived here most of my adult life. And um, uh, yeah, so I was an engineer at Cummins. Uh, it's a big company on the west side of town, and I worked there 35 years. And then I, uh, after I retired, uh, before I retired, I was on the Cummins uh, uh, Foundation Board, and we funded uh, the board uh, at the time um, with my uh, push. We funded the Fab Lab, uh, half of the Fab Lab in Stoughton, and the community funded the other half, right? So I was happily retired, and then um, somehow I got sucked into the school district and the Fab Lab. Uh, they say uh, Brian Shimmons, the vice principal, used to introduce me as the founder of the Fab Lab, and I really think that the Fab Lab found me. Um, so uh, uh, fast forward eight years uh, from 2013 when we opened the Fab Lab to now, um, uh, Superintendent uh, Tim Onsager, he's an awesome community champion. 
And he had the idea a couple of years ago to start this innovation center. So this is his idea and it's an awesome idea. It uh, kind of brings together all those things that we need to do, right? The curiosity of the community, the creativity of the community, the inclusion of the community and our resilience, right? So it's gonna be a place, uh, it's an outgrowth of the Fab Lab. So if we wouldn't have built this wonderful Fab Lab that's been uh, uh, recognized throughout the state as a state-of-the-art place, uh, we wouldn't have moved to this innovation center idea. So in late 2018, we got some funding from the Walleen Foundation, which uh, the Walleens are, are uh, awesome people in our community giving, uh, they're part of Stoughton Trailers, they're founders of Stoughton Trailers. Um, and they gave us $250,000 to start. So that was pretty awesome that industry was the first ones in, right? Government seems to be the one, the last ones in, right? Uh, the WDC and the state and, and the county. So, but I'm pinching them every day and, and, the, and the mayor knows that and the city, of course. Um, so I don't pinch too hard, but I wanna make sure that uh, this, this comes, this is gonna happen um, now that we have some funding um, it's going to happen. So it, it, uh, we want a downtown somewhere. It's going to be a combination of um, a place, uh, STEAM, right? So science, technology, engineering, art, and math for K to gray, we're saying. So that includes me now since, uh, since I, uh, yeah, so it, it's, uh, it's going to be one of those innovation centers, but it's going to uh, do more uh, economic development helping our local businesses, uh, a place for incubators, right? Uh, where do these students that come from the Fab Lab, these wonderful students we're producing, they go away to get their PhD in electrical engineering or some other things that we've seen recently. And uh, we want them back someday, right? Uh, we want a place for them to be attracted to. So uh, the mayor's been really supportive. It's been an awesome, uh, the county is working on it now. And I just want to introduce myself and the Innovation Center to you, Melissa, uh, because I will be, uh, <laughs> I'll be at your door knocking. Uh, the biggest thing I think is, uh, you know, the state uh, has supported the Fab Lab idea, right? Both sides of the aisle, all sides of the aisle. In fact, uh, Governor Evers, when he was state superintendent of schools, he cut our ribbon for our Fab Lab, he came. And two weeks later, uh, Governor Walker uh, came with uh, his, uh, and then a couple weeks later, um, I'm trying to think of her name now. She was the uh, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, we've, we, we always tell everybody, everybody wants good education on both sides of the aisle. So at that point, um, somebody in the uh, government, uh, I don't know where, but introduced a bill for the Fab Lab and it was a million dollar uh, gift, a grant system through the WDC. And Stoughton has, we've won uh, two out of the three grants, big grants for that. Um, so that's been awesome support. Uh, I think it got cut to a half a million by, by uh, the governor, but it's, it's a great support anyway. So uh, what I'm trying to uh, have you think about, I guess today, what I want you to dream about is this has been a difficult journey, right? This Fab Lab thing to the, to the Innovation Center. And I want uh, other people uh, in, the, in Wisconsin not to have such a difficult journey. In other words, uh, uh, if you can find a community champion or two or three or whatever uh, to, to get a Fab Lab going, uh, we should make it really easy for them to move to this Innovation Center idea, right? Um, and easy, I mean, um, the state should look at it and say, this is, you know, if, we, if you can get community support, then uh, let's buy into this thing and not be the last in, right? Uh, let's, let's have that entrepreneurial spirit, spirit which is uh, jump in feet, feet first with some money and see how this works. So I, I guess I'm here to, to ask you, number one, um, is just uh, follow us along and, and I'll be in contact with you, don't worry. <laughs> but, uh, but also think about the long term. Uh, we popped up, uh, we were the first Fab Lab in the state of Wisconsin, right? And now there's seven of them. And so um, uh, it's been an awesome experience for me. It's, it's bigger than I ever thought it would go, right? But uh, 
I, I think the communities that have fab labs should go to the next step, okay? Um, and I'd really like the state and, and you to think about putting that on your agenda is how do we take this economic development model, right, that we built, this uh, showing students of all ages to go from the virtual world to the physical world and we play and we create and, and we inspire. And uh, man, I've, I've learned more from this process than I learned in 35 years of mechanical engineering. <laughs> And it's been more fun. And I think learning should be fun. If I could, Mike, obviously, because you and I represent the, the, uh, the K to gray, um, but I just, for the community, um, with the, my three boys that went through and they all took advantage of the, of the fab lab. And it, it's a wonderful thing, just as you said, for just the, the wonderment of what that is. But I think it's important for the community to know some of the things that they have built in the fab lab. Um, one being, um, can you talk about, I believe Ian Borman um, built a, an appendage for uh, another student. Hello. That's, that's That's incredible. Lovely. Mike, do you wanna just talk about that for a second? Yeah, it was on uh, national news actually and on local news. Any, any one, a 16 year old from our fab lab won the citizen of the year. Um, for his work with, uh, uh, it's called the Helping Hand Project. So we built a, a, a hand for one of our sixth graders. I think it was a seventh grade by the time he got it. But, uh, and it worked, it was pretty awesome. Uh, custom made, uh, so every year when he grew, um, he got a new hand. So one of the problems to be solved in, in um, artificial limbs is that they don't, um, they, they don't want to give anybody uh, under the age, when their bones are done growing, we'll get you an arm, right? That's kind of the thing. And in the fab lab, that's totally wrong. We, we've we been printing, uh, we printed fingers, we've printed ears, uh, we've printed all kinds of uh, body parts. And we got a new printer that can print half a body part now so they can print um, the, top, um, the top half of me or the bottom half of me. Anyways, uh, Ian Borman then went on to get a full scholarship at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. But better than that, he works at the Discovery Center in University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he gave me a tour there. And he, this kid was 18 years old, right? And PhD students and uh, uh, MBA or uh, master's students were leaning on him uh, to make sure this, uh, how to run this printer and how to run this laser cutter and all this stuff. And I was there and they were asking him questions. And I, and I said, I said, you know, and it was just amazing experience for me. Um, yeah, so that's just one of them. And, and we have, I'll send you an email, uh, Melissa, with, uh, it's a three minute video of our alumni. So um, it's, a, it's an awesome video put together for our, with our alumni last, uh, we did it for the superintendents, um, a national superintendents association that was meeting that was supposed to be here in Stoughton, uh, but it was virtual. And the good news about the virtual was all these superintendents from around the United States, there's gonna be 30 of them come to Stoughton, right? But, it, but the meeting got uh, changed to virtual. We had 168 superintendents uh, come to our fab lab. And, and tour our school. And that was pretty cool. And if, if you want to put Stoughton on the map, the, the last three superintendents meetings were held in Boston, Massachusetts, LA, San Francisco, and Dallas. Okay. And then, then they came to Stoughton. <laughs> so, so it's pretty cool. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I could talk your leg off about Fab Lab and Innovation Center. So I'll be quiet and listen the rest of the hour. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming to the coffee with the mayor and coming to Stoughton on this cold morning. Have a good one. Thank you so very much. I really look forward to being able to take that tour myself and these innovation centers, um, fab labs. Uh, we have, you know, there's a couple of different uh, versions of this on the city of Madison, the bodegary and, and such. And, uh, they, it's just amazing what it is that you see people doing and knowing that when 
people are coming together, they're actually able to create something they never would have been able to create in their own workroom in their basement or their garage, right? Just the, the power of the spark of community is, is amazing. And I, I love um, the fact that it's multi-generational, provides purpose, um, provides a place in your community um, to strengthen everyone. And like you said, it provides innovation and um, builds towards the future. So thank you for your leadership on that and for taking the initiative to share. I look forward to that video um, and very much look forward to being able to spend time with you in person. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, you, like you said, you have one of the, the first, Sector 67, right? Mm -hmm. Was one of the first in, in Madison and, and we visited there before we built our own. And yeah, so that's awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any questions uh, for for Melissa today. All right, I'm not hearing anything. One of the things I wanted to do maybe Cindy is have you share with Melissa some of the partnerships and things that we have at the senior center. Um, maybe some of the features you have and how the the young work with, with the, uh, the seniors on and different things in your building. Yeah, we are, um, we are very fortunate. Um, I am a city employee, so our senior center is a, is a department of the city. So we have um, tremendous support from our city as well as our citizens. Um, and we've been able to be, uh, we've been nationally accredited and state accredited for many, many, many years. Um, so we are a multi-purpose senior center. So we try to look at programming and services from everywhere from 55 to 105. Um, so we look at um, kind of uh, all sorts of uh, aspects of someone's life, whether it be a support group, whether it be just camaraderie, uh, continuing education, wellness. So we try to look at, at all of those, of those things. Um, and uh, throughout the years, we've been very fortunate to collaborate with um, Stoughton Health here in town with uh, different uh, businesses um, because we have a, a relatively small staff. So we, uh, we have to collaborate a lot. Um, so the schools have been uh, a wonderful uh, connection for us, uh, whether it be um, entertainment through, you know, we have a wonderful uh, music and theater program here in Stoughton, or whether it be um, we've done one-on-one -on -one, um, kids coming in to help people. Usually it's after the uh, Christmas time, um, kids coming in to do one-on-one -on -one of, I got a new phone, uh, somebody gave me an iPad, uh, those kind of things. So we have um, some of those uh, opportunities, but we have been very fortunate um, to collaborate with um, our, uh, our community, business community being very um, beneficial for us as well. So we've uh, actually, we've been a senior center here since 72. Uh, we moved into this location that I hope you can come and visit soon um, in 93. So uh, the, Stoughton, the city of Stoughton has been always very supportive of older adults and kind of that continuing uh, aging in place uh, theme. Stoughton's a great place to live. Um, and obviously, particularly, I think for over 55 adults, I, I hope a lot of people move to Stoughton and uh, bring their kids, but um, that age in place. But yeah, we're, uh, we're very fortunate. So a couple things I would add, uh, Melissa, is they have an amazing wood shop in the basement of the senior center that uh, it'd be interesting to see if there's a partnership between that and the innovation center. Um, I think there's some, some overlap there. They provide just amazing uh, case management for seniors. Cindy, I don't know how much food you go through, but it's just amazing uh, what you do to, to help people. Yeah, we've still been delivering uh, Meals on Wheels throughout the pandemic, obviously. And uh, instead of people obviously being able to come into the senior center. We've kind of turned it into a drive-through event a couple times a, a month. And that has been over a hundred each time. 
Um, we have made sure that, you know, people have gotten emergency meals throughout, you know, our inclement weather. But um, yeah, we're, we're very fortunate to have social workers on staff. And so people are able to connect to talk about resources or transitions in some of their health and how do they, you know, our goal is to keep people uh, in their homes safely. So that's our, that's our goal to have, uh, and to be dignified. I think the dignity and age is, is so important and that is a major goal of ours. And part of that goes back to, you know, being connected to your community. I'm, as I said uh, about uh, Mike's project, the idea that older adults find value in themselves and giving back to their community is so vital. Um, so when we're talking about, and I get really excited when people include older adults when they're planning something. I think every business and every organization should think about not just how do we you know, look at our services to families, but I think to not uh, forget that there are some really vital uh, members of our community who have such knowledge and so are so excited to help, you know, those of us who uh, are excited about when Setna Mai comes around, my joke always is, you know, when you're buying a button for Setna Mai, more than likely somebody with gray hair is selling you the button. So it's, it's the older adult that really has been volunteering for, for so long in our community. And I think when someone is planning something like the Innovation Center, it's, it's really exciting to know that they're including older adults. You bring up Sutton to mind, it reminds, brings me back to uh, some memories I had as a little girl coming, going out to Stoughton and watching the parade. And I always wanted to wear one of those traditional dresses with the, the, the frock on the front with the um, flowers in my hair and the ribbons. <laughs> Call the bunad. We can probably, if you come back for a, a parade, we can probably set you up with a bunad. You, you turned me to, into an eight-year-old again with, with those <laughs> memories. Yeah. Um, really, it, it is it's so very important to think about multi-generational supports. I mean, not only having the young people come in and, you know, like you said, helping someone with a cell phone or an iPad, but helping our young people understand um, the importance of honoring those who have come before and, um, you know, filling holes in one another's lives. I, you know, I'm a single mom and I'm, you know, pretty busy uh, with this job. And I always appreciate it when my kids are invited into the community, when there's options in the community for them to make connections with other people, regardless of the age, because really the more tight knit the community is, the healthier everyone is, um, whether it's our young people or our seniors. Um, and it sounds like what, type of program that you're running there does just that. You know, it takes those silos down, it removes those barriers and actually levels that playing field, brings us more together. Um, and it, it sounds so, so very wonderful. And I look forward to being able to come and spend some time with you. Uh, there's um, some senior programs in my neighborhood and I've had the honor of calling bingo, um, being at Apple Fest celebrations, um, introducing bands uh, in, on warm summer nights when the, the bands come and play for the community, um, serving hot dogs at, at other, other events. So please don't hesitate to reach out to our office if there are opportunities like that in your community as well. It's fabulous to do a tour, but it, you know I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty and, and to lend my work and the work of my staff um, to strengthen your community and volunteer our time as well. We will not forget that. <laughs> Thank you. I would, one of the challenges, Melissa, that we have here and obviously in, in Dane County is, is housing, especially uh, affordable housing, you know, for seniors and, and for younger families as well. And that was something that I wanted to make sure that was mentioned today to just kind of put that thought in your head as far as what you can do at your level to help support um, some more options. So housing, uh, I believe very much is a fundamental human right. And um, you're right, there are too many barriers to access housing. And in Wisconsin and in Dane County, it is exceptionally challenging for our seniors. Um, you know, whether it's tax structures, uh, whether it is 
um, you know, moving out of your family home because taking care of it or the size of it just doesn't fit anymore and being able to find the right fit that is affordable and safe um, in a community that you belong to and being able to honor that community. Those are, those are all challenges, as well as for young families who are just starting to put their roots down and knowing that you know, it is important for communities to have people at all different ages um, in order to have a strong flourishing community that you know, has, has hope to building in the future. And I know, Mira Swadley, that this is something that you are working very hard on. I feel like every time we get together, we talk about it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I did ask to be put on the Housing Committee for the State Senate. And I am the ranking Democrat on the Wisconsin State Senate Housing um, Committee. We have not met yet. I haven't had the opportunity to meet with the chair of the committee to find out what their um, what their thoughts are about what it is that we do. But certainly, I have a number of different policies um, and ideas, and I would love to know what it is you know that would help Stoughton in particular. I think part of the 16th Senate District is there are some communities like Monona that are completely um, landlocked. Uh, and then there are other communities like Stoughton where there's an awful lot of room for growth. And the challenges that the mayors are experiencing and the councils are experiencing in these two cities that I brought up just now are very different. Um, but I do think that the moral compass that these mayors have and the hope for supporting everyone in their communities and in Dane County are very similar. Um, so how it is that I, as a state legislator, can support that local control, um, support those people that are right there on the ground, not insert myself too much, but also make sure that we're not creating policy that prohibits you um, from knowing what is best for your community is vitally important to me. Um, and, you know, you have some amazing opportunities for jobs. I know that uh, that you have a number of small businesses that I am sure um, have struggled through this um, COVID pandemic that are just chomping at the bit to be able to open their doors up again to all of you, um, as well as large one of the largest employers in Dane County with Stoughton Trailer, right? So having that, that real diverse um, economic opportunities in your community, as well as such a brand um, and an investment in one another uh, is really important. And what I'm seeing today on this call is people who are so proud to call Stoughton home and really have a ded dedication and a determination to continue investing in that strength. Well, Melissa, if I, if I could, um, and you speaking of every time you see Tim, you talk about housing. Um, Tim could roll his eyes at how many times he and I talk about housing. Um, <laughs> But I think what what you're you're getting at is exactly right. When we talk about dignity in in age, housing is is a piece of that. And I think if the trend continues, a lot of our older adults really are going to have to move out of the county mm -hmm. to access um, affordable housing. Um, you mentioned that someone who sells their family home should be able to stay in their community, and it's becoming harder and harder. For our older adults to find affordable because you know that has a meaning to a hundred different people but if you are strictly living off of social security you can't afford a market rate apartment obviously um you know i'm not telling you anything you that you know, you've no, we have a we have a number of options uh we have the venable neighborhood and someday we can talk about how that works it's similar, I would say, to a reverse mortgage type situation. Uh, we have um, Greenspire, which is under our housing authority. Um, we do have some other neighborhoods um, where there's some condos, uh, but certainly there, there's not enough inventory in Stoughton as well as Dane County as a whole. And then the other issue that kind of goes hand in hand with that is transportation. We're fortunate to have a shared ride service um, through the state of Wisconsin and, and city of Stoughton. We'd like to be able to expand that because oftentimes, especially with our seniors, getting transportation to Madison, especially for their health care needs, is a real challenge for us. And I know Cindy, you know, has certainly some some options to try to help people, but you know, oftentimes it's just not enough. It's absolutely, it's, it's, it's vitally important. And you are both, you know, it, I am glad that you're talking about it. And I, I believe that we all need to be doing more. I, 
am grateful that our county executive does prioritize affordable housing. Um, and it is all very important that we engage with our county board supervisors um, and make sure that you have vo voices outside of the city of Madison. I think oftentimes when people think about the county board, um, they feel like too much attention is being paid on the city. And I know that you have a um, service center um, that is run by the county that uh, has scaled back on what it is that it provides. Um, and, you know, I, I very much believe in the decentralization of services. I know, I mean, I'm sure you've had these conversations as a mayor, right? Like you can save money uh, if you bring everything together into one place. And, you know, there are some benefits to that, but also saving lives um, is important. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you still have some some services that are available, but, and I know that our state government has made it so very, very hard um, for our local, um, our local governments to be able to invest in themselves, you know, the removal of local control, um, the capping of the levy limits um, and such. And, you know, Governor Evers has included in his budget a provision that would allow the county to actually increase um, its sales tax by, um, I believe, a half of a percent uh, to go to services within the county. I'm not sure that that will stay in considering the makeup of our legislature, but you know that was a side effect of Act 10, which occurred 10 years ago. Um, and not only had an effect on our public school teachers, but had an effect on people like Mayor Swadley to be able to do his job correctly. I know you have an amazing county board supervisor out there. I served on the county board before I was in the legislature and Carl was one of my very favorite colleagues. Um, and uh, you know, I, I know that he is there when I need him to talk to me as a legislator about what's going on in your community. Not only is Tim there, but Carl is. Um, and I hope that you all feel that he's accessible to you as well. Um, and I look forward to being able to have more conversations about all the different levels of government and how it is that we support each other um, on topics such as affordable housing. Thank you. Are there any other questions from, from folks that are on the call? You've been listening to us talk, but we certainly want to give you an opportunity to share some of your thoughts or concerns about um, what we can do either at the local or the state level to, to support things that are important to you. Hi, Melissa. Roger Thompson from the Stoughton Dems. How are you doing today? I'm good. I saw you down there, Roger, with your famous Beverly's iPad name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I just wonder if you could give us any update on uh, gerrymandering and where you think that might be going to help to help get some state and local control back in, in line. So. Yeah, gerrymandering. Uh, that's the big elephant in the room when we talk about public policy in the state of Wisconsin. Um, it's clear that based on the last number of elections in Wisconsin that people are voting more um, progressive in general. There are people that, you know, that's part of our, our nation's promise is that everyone should feel safe to vote for who it is that they want. Um, but the cornerstone of our democracy is um, fair, free, safe elections. And gerrymandering um, is having a direct effect on how fair our elections actually are in Wisconsin. Uh, we are um, probably the worst or you know, in the top handful of worst states for gerrymandering um, in the nation and have an opportunity to address that because we just had a census done at the national level. So every 10 years after the census, states are required to redraw the boundaries of the districts that elected officials hold from our congressional districts to our legislative districts, to our county districts, to our cities, towns and villages, et cetera. Um, and that is so that we equalize population so that one voice, one vote actually does represent the same number of people that not one legislator or representative has more or less people that they're representing. And you'll probably remember the map that was at, on the screen at the very beginning of this conversation that the mayor put up. Um, gerrymandered districts tend to have um, pretty zigzaggy boundaries and strange shapes in states that have um, more fair gerrymandering, such as Iowa, you're going to see much straighter um, and more uh, predictable lines um, to those districts. 
So uh, in this district, the 16th Senate district, there's a really unlikely chance that a Republican would be able to win this seat because when these district lines were drawn, um, they were drawn to squish a whole lot of more progressive leaning Democrats together. And that can be very frustrating um, for folks who are not progressive Democrats. As well, across the state of Wisconsin, the other side of that coin, which is the fact that about two thirds of the districts in the state of Wisconsin have been drawn to heavily support and lean in the more Republican way. Um, and this is because 10 years ago when our maps were drawn, uh, the Republican legislature, as well as the fact that they had um, Governor um, Walker in the governor's office, drew the maps by hiring high powered attorneys and cart cartographers um, at the state's dime on computers that were not in the, in the Capitol. So with, without transparency and without legislative input or input from the people of the state of Wisconsin. And there were in fact lawsuits about that. And a few districts had to be redrawn um, in, order to, in order to address some of the more egregious challenges from that process. So we are right on the cusp of redrawing maps in the state of Wisconsin. And um, Governor Evers has created a task force or had created a task force um, of folks to um, talk about the redistricting process in Wisconsin in a nonpartisan way and how we can do this um, to honor the will of the people as opposed to to honor um, those that are going to be voting on the maps like me and my political, um, my legislative colleagues. Um, so. Um, Governor Evers has been working very hard on this um, with his People's Maps Coalition. However, the legislature does still have the ability um, to draw maps as well. And I anticipate that there will be lawsuits that go back and forth between what it is that the Republican legislators do um, as the majority party, what the governor does, um, as well as much of the testimony that the governor has received at his People's Maps Coalition's meetings. Um, so it's going to be a very, very interesting time here in Wisconsin and gerrymandering is a complicated topic um, and it's a funny word, um, but ultimately it is the reason why people are so frustrated with government and how it is or isn't working. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have a subject they'd like to speak to today? I'd like to take a minute. Um, if it's okay, um, to point out in the chat feature, and I don't know if all of you know how to access the chat feature, um, but Aaron has taken a moment to type in our contact information for the office. So you'll have the email address, which is sen, S-E-N dot agard, A-G-A-R-D, at legis, L-E-G-I-S dot W-I, or you can spell Wisconsin all out if you really like typing, dot gov, G-O-V. And our phone number, which is 608-266-9170. And we encourage you to reach out to us about anything. And if, if it isn't a state issue, we'll get you pointed in the right direction for who it is that can help you out. Um, we are at your service um, in our office and honestly can't do our jobs without you. Um, additionally, Megan is on the call with us and um, we can all see her beautiful face right now. And I just want you all to see Megan. She was just waving at you. Um, and Megan is our outreach director in the district. Um, and she and I will be working um, after COVID is over to be able to set our, um, our feet on the sidewalks of your communities, knock on doors, um, meet with you at libraries and coffee shops and taverns and such and have conversations all across the 16th district. So if there's places you want to meet, if there's certain topics, you know, we're thinking about walks in the park, maybe um, we could have an ice cream social, uh, you know, that the sky's the limit and, and the more creative the more fun it is for us. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us with any ideas. Uh, and I think it's just nice when you can see who it is that's on the other side of that call. You all got to see Erin earlier and there's Megan. Thank you. All right, one last chance for questions for, uh, for Senator Agard. 
All right, I'm not hearing any. You're welcome to, to stay. We have a few more things that I would cover today, but I know you have a busy schedule. So if you need to go, we certainly understand. And we really appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much, everyone. I look forward to when we can actually meet in person um, and stay warm and don't forget to mask up if you have to go outside. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I have a few other things we can go through today. And if you have any questions for me, I'll be more than happy to answer them. I just wanted to give you a brief update on the election. Uh, today is the last day for early voting for the uh, superintendent of public instruction primary. There are seven candidates. The election day is next Tuesday. Um, the next election will be April 6th. And there'll be some school board candidates, um, some city council candidates that are running unopposed. And then the superintendent of public instruction will be on there as well. Um, we're hoping to have Holly at our next meeting so she can give you an update from the clerk's office. Some of the things the city council has been working on um, that, you know, I just have a list of them and I'll just highlight a couple. Uh, you probably heard that we revoked the liquor license for shakers. Um, we've been working on some things in regards to uh, Kettle Park West to get them ready for construction here um, this year. Um, we've been working on some different ordinances, um, some things that might affect uh, you folks is uh, we did accept a grant for another uh, accessible van for the shared ride taxi program. So we uh, we'll have all the vehicles for the taxi program. We'll have a lift on them now. Once that vehicle's in operation, it does take several months to receive the van and get the lift installed on it. But we're we're excited to have another one in our fleet, and we can finally retire the Crown Vic that you might have ridden in a few times. Um, I'm sure the drivers will appreciate that as well. Uh, also, some other things we've worked on most recently. Um, we're doing quite a bit of work in our parks. We had a, an audit done for uh, American Disabilities Act. And one of our initiatives right now is to get our, our parks more um, compliant uh, for folks that um, you know, want to be able to enjoy the parks but can't get around. So a lot of trail work, um, even some equipment out at Nordic Ridge will be done this year, will be accessible for, for people with disabilities. So we're excited to do this work. It's, it's going to be, you know, kind of a marathon to get them all done. Uh, but we're excited that we can, um, you know, make some progress on that. We're going to be doing some improvements at Rotary Park as well, including adding a restroom down there. So if you're down there for the, for the gazebo music, we'll have uh, real bathrooms and, and not a, you know, a porta potty. Um, you might have heard that we're, we're looking to expand the senior center. I know Cindy's excited about that. And we're looking at um, doing that transition in 2023. There'll be a fundraising program um, starting that Cindy will be working on. I don't know if you want to touch on that at all, Cindy. Sure. Yeah, we were, we were very happy um, that, uh, that that was decided uh, just this last Tuesday that we can move forward with that. Uh, we'll start our fundraising for, uh, it's estimated $150,000 to renovate um, the, uh, the annex portion. Uh, and we're very excited about expanding the programming, um, having some space to do larger groups. That's really been the one thing, as I mentioned before with our accreditation, you know, when we look at, you know, evaluating everything we do, one thing that we were always just a little short on were large, larger wellness activities that we really just don't have the space to do currently. Uh, when we do the renovation, we will. And so I'm very excited about that. Um, so you'll, uh, you'll start to see some fundraisers uh, for our uh, expansion there. Uh, we also still fundraise, uh, for those of you who don't know, we fundraise just regular operational budget uh, amount for the Senior Center uh, a year, about $29,000, 29500 
dollars, uh, $29,500 is what we fundraise each year. So on top of that, we'll be doing a large campaign for the $150,000. So uh, you'll see uh, different fundraisers popping up. You'll be a little tired of it by the time we get to the end of the 150, I'm sure, but uh, we'll be starting that very soon. All right, thank you. Um, we're also uh, looking to expand uh, citizen participation in our committees. So we have an application process that people will be able to fill out if they want to volunteer to be on one of our committees or commissions or boards. And what we're trying to do is really reach out to more people and get more diversity um, within these uh, different groups. Um, and then also uh, we're gonna be um, considering whether or not we should add citizens um, to our, what we call our standing committees. Uh, there's six of them. We'd like to do it on five of them, which would be uh, the Park and Rec Committee, the Finance Committee, uh, the Community Affairs Council Policy Committee, Public Works, and Public Safety. So we'll be working on that next month at our Community Affairs Council Policy Committee. And Tim, if I, if I could, for sure. that one especially, one of the things that we like to do is to, for our Commission on Aging, and it would work for any of these, is really encourage people to attend some of those. And now that it's virtual, it's a little bit easier to attend um, some of those meetings. Um, so I would encourage anyone who's, you know, as you move forward on that to just, because I think a lot of people think, oh, I can't do that. Oh, I, you know, I don't have anything to, you know, put forward. I think in just looking at, you know, in attending some of those meetings, uh, it would uh, hopefully encourage people to see that they do have, um, you know, input that is needed. Okay. Uh, one of the other things that was passed on Tuesday night was the council approved the staff to uh, move forward with, um, Bob Dvorak, who has this development on 51 West. As you look at the map, the east side is uh, over near Eggleston's Woods, and then the west side is right across the street. And one of the things I wanted to highlight here is the yellow with the black dots. On the east side is a trail system, which would connect to Virgin Lake Park and go through the park here. You can see the brown is a multi-unit housing. The orange is duplexes. And then on the west side, the red is kind of a placeholder for potential retail. It could be one big building. It could be a strip mall or several smaller buildings. And then there's some more brown, which I said is the multi-unit housing. We're hoping perhaps that um, some of this might be workforce or affordable housing. Uh, we've had a number of developers that are interested in applying for WIDA grants. Um, to do that sort of housing. Those grants um, are due in December. So we probably wouldn't know until late in the year uh, whether or not somebody has applied for them grants and whether or not they've been awarded. Um, there's also some fourplex lots here that there's been some interest in. And then these orange duplex lots here on the west side, um, at least some of them, if not all of them, will be what they call zero entry. So they're designed for, for seniors that, you know, at some point might, um, you know, have some disabilities to make it more user friendly to enter and exit these units. So that's something that you should be aware of. And then the yellow would be single family homes. And I'm not really sure what the price range will be of them yet. Um, we anticipate that if this development goes through, that the east side will be developed first. There's quite a bit of uh, water uh, work that needs to be done as far as the stormwater ponds, upgrading uh, the water lines and upgrading the sanitary sewer lines in order to serve uh, the west side as well. So that'll be a process that will take several months to go through but the council at least gave us the green light to work with the developer to try to work on the specific details of that project. And Tim, uh, just, I have a question. So obviously there's not that many single family homes uh, in this project, but if I remember correctly, the phase two of KPW is almost entirely 
single family homes, correct? Yeah, there's almost 200 units. Right, and which would be, uh, if I get my, so south west of this development would be that. Right, yeah, if you get over to the, the west side here, um, you can see that this is Oak Opening Drive here between the brown and the red going south between the two ponds. And that would connect um, over toward kind of a Kettle Park West area over behind Stoughton Lumber and the Kettle Park West would be a little bit more, you know, west of that where the, where the cornfield is kind of on the end of Jackson Street going out towards there's a woods there where the park will be and then there's a pond out there. So, um, and those homes out there will be at multiple price points. Some of them would be what I call Viridian style homes with the smaller lots and the private alleyways to get from in and out of their driveways or back to back. So those tend to be around the 300,000 range, give or take. And that's really because the cost of building materials has skyrocketed. And then some of the other homes are on a little bit bigger lots. I think there's three different size lots. Um, and then there would also be potential for some smaller uh, multi-unit homes as well. And then uh, some duplexes in some later phases. So between the two developments, I think we're gonna have a nice variety of homes and options for people that wanna either move or, or to Stoughton or or maybe you know upgrade or, or downsize their homes, um, just really depending on what people's needs. So getting some inventory here, I think is really important. I saw some emails yesterday that said there's only eight single family homes on the market in Stoughton right now. And I know when I did real estate, oh, probably about seven, eight years ago, you know, typically you would have 45 um, homes on the market in the city of Stoughton at a given time. So it really shows you there's really a lack of inventory right now. And that's part of the reason why home prices and really even your property taxes are going up because when there's not much inventory, you know, the sellers can sell their homes for top dollar and it really raises the price for everybody else. So having more inventory here, I think would be a good thing, not only, you know, for options for people to live, but really for property values in general um, to really get things, you know, a little bit recalibrated. Um, some of the other things we're working on, we're still working on the riverfront. This is kind of what it looks like as far as the layout. Um, this is the redevelopment area here. Um, and then we've been doing quite a bit of work. Our planning department, Rodney Shield, has been working on um, this trail system that's going through here. And you can see the, the trail that goes through and these little extensions that go out kind of toward the river. Um, they call them nodes. And those are opportunities for people to hang out or to fish. Those are good fishing areas there. You can see there's a bridge that would go across that would lead to Mant Park. And then, you know, basically just some other trails that split off um, in this development. So we're working with um, Kurt Brink and we've uh, been having a couple meetings the last, uh, couple, last week or so, uh, working toward the developer's agreement. We kind of have a draft, the RDA, Redevelopment Authority, looked at the draft um, Wednesday night, and then uh, we'll continue to, to work to, out the details of that. So hopefully within the next couple of months, we'll, we'll have a, a, you know, be under contract with the developer out there so they can start work this year yet. Um, the DOT is gonna be doing some work. Um, This area here is some improvements that would be out toward uh, Dvorak's development um, out on Rutland Dunn Road. They're looking at including this work as part of the 51 corridor work. Um, the 51 corridor work goes all the way from basically Coachman's all the way to McFarland. And you can see when it's all said and done with, you know, we're gonna have, you know, some roundabouts going through Stoughton. Um, and next year we'll have um, basically three of them that are gonna be installed. 
And then there's plans to do some upgrades. Um, Highway AB, I think, is one they're targeting for somewhere around the year 2024. That's a bad intersection. And we're, we have a meeting with the DOT again next week. We're going to continue to push to get um, a roundabout at Highway B. But at this point, that one's not scheduled to be done yet. I'm not sure if it's going to be part of a safety program which is separate from the corridor program or if it's going to be included into that corridor program. Um, probably heard us talking quite a bit about Starbucks and coffee in general. Um, the Starbucks is, is hoping to move into the old National Bank building in front of Pick and Save. And we're working on that with them right now to kind of try to improve the traffic flow situation there because we know that with the drive through they'll have a lot of customers and we're working through them issues right now. They have to have us approve what we call a conditional use permit, which allows them to use the drive through And really state law was changed a few years ago. So on a conditional use permit, if we were to look to, to not deny usage, we would have to have some real specific criteria that would have to be met to do that. The, the bar is really high. We can't say no to a business that wants to come to Stoughton just because we don't want them or some people would prefer not to have them. We have to be able to show that what they're proposing, you know, really would propose a, you know, a safety problem or, you know, something that would affect property values. And we'd really have to be able to, to prove that in order to deny such a thing. So we're trying to work through the safety issues with, with Starbucks right now. They would try to be open sometime this year. Uh, one of the projects that we're gonna be working on this year, I'm really uh, pleased to hear about is the Habitat for Humanity project. And this is a kind of a rendition of what their duplexes would look like. They're hoping to build four of them out on Lincoln Avenue between Hamilton and Jackson Street. And uh, they're looking at doing that. Um, this year, they have to put a road and do some sewer and water work out there as well. Um, but we feel that this will be a nice addition and give four families an opportunity to have some affordable housing. So that's basically what I had today, unless anybody has any questions. I just had a quick one, Mayor Swadley, on your, uh, uh, I'm a bicyclist, so let me put my bicycle hat on, <laughs> and that is uh, on the trail. Um, at one point in time, I was working with Nancy Hagen years ago, and on, a, on the um, bicycle trail, try to get out of town, and that was uh, to extend the trail from Rutland Dunn uh, along that property line um, uh, to that to that development, so um, I don't know who would I talk to to get that. Uh, You're talking that, about this map here. Yeah, go up uh, to the to the a um, uh, few slides before that. A uh, few before that, even when you were talking about the uh, the Dvorak property. The Dvorak property. Thank you. Yeah, that one. If you look at the end of Rutland Dunn, there's actually kind of a walking trail. Um, that kind of goes straight, I'd say straight east from that, from that intersection. And at one point, the master plan that I saw that Nancy and I had worked on long before during Helen Johnson's era was that it would, that the bike trail or the walking, uh, at that time it was a bike trail, would come um, along that property line and, and, and cross 51 or you know, have a safe crossing there uh, to get to Rutland Dunn Town Road and out, outside of town. Because right now bicyclists actually ride along 51 there, which I'm one of them, and it's crazy. Um, uh, it's, it's just a short stretch. It's a half mile stretch, but it's really dangerous. So that's why we propose that crossing there. So what a I couple, talk to about? Yeah, go ahead. A couple things you should know um, is on 51, um, kind of south on this map, one of the things that's included in the corridor project is a, a 10 foot sidewalk. Okay. Um, so, you know, we, we think we'll have some flexibility to use that. Um, I'll have to 
find out exactly how far it extends. I know it goes out toward Jackson. Okay. Um, one of the reasons we're meeting with the DOT next week is we've been talking to them throughout this corridor process. I mean, they've been talking about doing improvements to 51 since 1999. And most recently, a couple of years ago, when they were in Stoughton to do an update on this project, um, I introduced uh, Bob Dvorak to them to let them know that, hey, you know, this project is something that should be on your radar. And based on conversations we've had, uh, they decided um, in the region to start having um, these committee meetings in order to discuss future projects and how they might um, how they might be implemented into these uh, improvements that they're doing so we don't put in a new road and then a couple of years later say oh we should have done this mm -hmm. so that we're trying to be a little bit more proactive and the DOT has recognized that so the meeting we're having next week um, Bob Dvorak has is joining the meeting so we can talk about some of his ideas and then also a representative uh, from the Linaroods property has been invited as well and one of the things that we have presented to the DOT already is the potential to put an underpass in um, and you know more than likely that would be located on the Linarood property which right now is basically for sale and so there's a lot of uncertainty on, you know, what the owners would want to do and how they might want to participate with that. But that's one of the things that we want to talk to the DOT about because we know it'll be more cost effective to install that while they're doing the highway improvements. And we anticipate the highway improvements could be done as soon as, you know, sometime in the next 10 years. And we would like to at least be able to get from one side, side of the highway to the other safely. Yeah. And then have all the trail systems, you know, eventually connect over to the lower Yahara River Trail as well. Yeah. Okay. So there, there is a lot of work. Um, I can certainly, um, you know, bring your feedback to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Do you have any of those maps or? Uh, I probably do. I'll have to look to see, um, you know, they're going to be 15 years old, but. That's um, okay. They were wish lists at the time, you know, like how do you get out of town safely? And I think as long as you guys are considering an underpass there, because it's it's an awesome place for an underpass, the, the grade is perfect. You know, um, dig a hole and put a culvert in, like at Coachman's, you know, they right. Coachman's, they, they did that at Coachman's uh, Golf Resort when they built the highway. And mm -hmm. Nobody crosses that highway anymore mm -hmm. at a golf cart. So, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you guys are thinking about that because that's, uh, that's a huge deal to get out of town that way. And, and I would personally love it, but I, but I see bicycles there all the time on that little stretch of 51. And when I'm driving, I think those guys are crazy or those people are crazy. And then when I'm on it, I'm, I'm like uh, the frog trying to cross the road, right? <laughs> and uh, it's going to get ugly. Yeah. Yeah, so send you what you have. It's always okay. helpful if the DOT knows that this is something that's been discussed for many years. Yeah, I think that helps build our case for it. Okay, I will. Thank you. Thanks for your sure. time. Sure, and, thank uh, you. Great meeting. All right. Does anybody else have anything today? Uh, once again, I'd like to you know thank you for joining us. I'm hoping to have our, our clerk and our planning director at the next meeting, uh, Holly and Rodney. And if you have any questions between now and then, uh, you know, feel free to contact myself or Cindy. Thanks a lot, Tim. Really appreciate your time. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Tim.